killed him. You can't kill the boogeyman. You know you're watching a John Carpenter film if... Carpenter tells you you're watching a John Carpenter film. Carpenter has incorporated his name into most of his film's titles, starting with his third feature, Halloween. There's more than vanity to this. Carpenter grew up in Bowling Green, Kentucky and started making his own movies at an early age. He particularly admired directors with strong directorial touches like John Ford, Alfred Hitchcock, Sergio Leone, and especially Howard Hawks. Yeah, so I wish you hadn't done that, Hilly. Done what? Divorce me. Makes a fella lose all faith in himself. Gives him a... Almost gives him a feeny he wasn't wanted. Filmmakers whose work could not be mistaken for anyone else's. Incorporating his name into the titles ties him to a tradition of auteurs who took top-to-bottom responsibility for their films. It establishes an unsettling atmosphere from the start. Over the past decade, Carpenter has emerged as a major influence on a generation of creators who grew up watching his movies. You know what that is? <laughs> what? Melted plastic and microwave bubblegum. No way. David Gordon Green has said he would not have directed his new Halloween sequel without Carpenter's blessing. The bus crashed. Michael Myers escaped. Adam Wingard's The Guest is one of many recent thrillers to play like feature-length homages to Carpenter. While we had him with the study, he killed several people and escaped, then he burned their bodies to confuse us. We thought he died in the fire initially, and by the time we figured out what he'd done, the trail was cold. Maybe you shouldn't have tested your procedures on a psychopath. And of course, Carpenter's work is very much a part of the DNA of Stranger Things, from the look of the show to its score. What's made his work so haunting and enduring? To begin with, Carpenter understands the value of setting the scene. He lingers on an image a beat or two longer than most directors would, creating a sense of the unfamiliar even when filming otherwise mundane surroundings. In Assault on Precinct 13, Carpenter builds tension from the image of an empty parking lot, one we know could be filled at any moment by a vicious gang. Halloween contains scenes of a seemingly idyllic American suburb, then twists that imagery by dropping a masked killer in its midst. What's the boogeyman? Prince of Darkness turns a downtown Los Angeles church into a place of dread, both outside, as a group of zombie-like homeless residents surround it, and in, as a group of scientists begin to suspect that a strange substance might be beyond their understanding. Nothing anywhere ever is supposed to be able to do what it is doing. Even a lesser effort like Village of the Damned benefits from the eerie establishing shots that open the film. It sounds like a Carpenter film. Carpenter has written or co-written the scores to most of his films, ever since his 1974 feature debut, Dark Star. Carpenter's father was a music professor at Western Kentucky University, where Carpenter did some of his undergrad work. His spare, unsettling, pulsing, mostly electronic music is as much a Carpenter signature as any of his visual touches. Even when the director works with other composers like Ennio Morricone for The Thing and Jack Nietzsche for Starman, they tend to create scores in the Carpenter mold, relying more on electronic instruments rather than traditional orchestral sounds. It features fluid, widescreen photography. Carpenter suffered in the VHS era due to pan and scan, a process that cropped widescreen compositions to fit the narrower aspect ratio of pre-HD televisions. And that's because few directors make such deliberate use of widescreen images. Carpenter fills the frame with significant details, whether he's capturing a sweeping vista or a claustrophobic interior. He was an early champion of the Steadicam and he unlocked its potential to create unease, thanks to its unfixed quality and usefulness for long, uninterrupted takes. In Halloween, the Steadicam makes us feel disturbingly close to the action, whether Carpenter is using it for the famous first-person opening scene, or simply following Laurie and her friends home from school. Later in the film, he pulls back from a pair of eager teens making out on a couch to slowly introduce a terrifying detail in another part of the frame. The macho hero is this close to parody. A fan of John Wayne and Clint Eastwood, Carpenter likes to feature tough guy protagonists. Life's a bitch. She's back in heat. But he also likes to tweak them, usually with the help of Kurt Russell. I was born ready. Russell and Carpenter first teamed up for the hit TV biopic, Elvis. I want to be an entertainer. I, I want to sing in a gospel quartet. 
and they've played around with American icons ever since. Call me Snake. In Escape from New York, Russell Snake Pliskin plays like an unsmiling Eastwood hero going through the latest in a long series of bad days. You're a cop. I'm an asshole. He's almost, but not quite, a send up of an action movie hero. You gonna kill me now, Snake? I'm too tired. Maybe later. Russell played it just as grumpy, but much straighter in The Thing. He ain't tying me up. Then I'll have to kill you, child. In Big Trouble in Little China, he pulls out all the stops as Jack Burton, drawing on his old Elvis performance and bringing in some notes of John Wayne to play a truck driver too dumb to realize he has no idea what he's doing as he's drawn into a mystery in San Francisco's Chinatown. We may be trapped. Carpenter wants us to enjoy everything that makes watching no-nonsense, fight-first, ask-questions-later heroes so fun to watch, while also reminding us not to take them that seriously. Ah, you know what old Jack Burton always says at a time like this? Who? Jack Burton. Me. With his love of over-the-top machismo, it makes perfect sense that he would look to the world of professional wrestling for the star of They Live, Rowdy Roddy Piper. I have come here to chew bubblegum and kick ass. It's a slow burn. Carpenter's thrillers increase suspense by increments. The tension in films like Assault on Precinct 13, Halloween, and The Thing builds and builds as series of disconcerting episodes reveal themselves as real dangers. I don't know what the hell's in there, but it's weird and pissed off, whatever it is. A dog showing up at an Antarctic outpost after inexplicably being hunted from a helicopter leads to a later scene of the same dog walking down a hallway just a touch too deliberately, then one of it watching a helicopter land, and then one of it acting strangely when placed in a kennel with other dogs. <laughs> Finally, only after all these scenes, then does all hell break loose. But when it's scary, it's really scary. Almost inevitably, chaos starts to overwhelm the characters of a Carpenter film. In In the Mouth of Madness, Sam Neill plays insurance investigator John Trent, who's looking into the disappearance of best-selling horror author Sutter Kane. Trent fights the idea that he's trapped in one of Kane's stories until he can't deny it any longer. It's Kane's story, and it'll spread with each new reader. That's how it gets its power. The concept is especially disturbing in the hands of a director who spent much of his career using horror as a dark reflection of the real world and is here letting one slip into the other. This is not reality! <laughs> Reality is not what it used to be. Adapting Stephen King's Christine, Carpenter had the challenge of making a possessed Plymouth Fury. He made it work. It relies more on tension than gore. Halloween beget dozens, maybe hundreds of imitators that filled movie screens with blood and guts in the early 80s. But Halloween itself suggests more than it shows. The violence is explicit, but relatively bloodless. If there's an overt model, it's Hitchcock's Psycho. Terrifying, but also carefully orchestrated. But when it does go for the gore, it goes all out. <laughs> Carpenter knew how to use gory imagery as effective punctuation. For The Thing, he brought in effects master Rob Bottin to create disturbing, otherworldly images of twisted anatomy. It has a strong, anti-authoritarian bent. Though born in upstate New York, Carpenter grew up in the still-segregated south of Kentucky, disturbed by the stories and opinions of many of his neighbors. He lived through the counterculture rebellions of the 60s, so it's little surprise his films expressed a distrust of authority. Freedom's up. In America, I died a long time ago. In Escape from New York, soldier-turned-outlaw Snake only reluctantly agrees to help the U.S. government save the president and end an ongoing war in order to win his own freedom. I don't give a f about your war or your president. And in the end, he finds their motivations too distasteful not to sabotage. In Assault on Precinct 13 and Ghosts of Mars, cops find they have to forge alliances with criminals for the greater good. You saved my life. Twice now. Twice? You must be serious about keeping me alive. 
Whether it's the corrupt government of Escape from New York and Escape from LA, the alien-infested society of They Live, or the local police who can't get it together to stop Michael Myers in Halloween, there's a pervasive sense in Carpenter's films that institutions inevitably let down those they're supposed to protect, and it's up to the heroes to stand up for themselves and what they believe. Carpenter is rarely openly political. He used to annoy liberal friends by wearing a John Wayne pin out of admiration for Wayne's artistry, not his politics. But with They Live, he made a remarkable exception. The poor and the underclass are growing. Racial justice and human rights are non-existent. In the heart of the Reagan era, he told the allegorical story of a drifter who discovers glasses that allow him to see the aliens who have colonized Earth. The subliminal messages they use to make humans obedient consumers, and the power structure that makes the rich richer and the poor poorer. The golden rule. He who has the gold makes the rule. The movie's message is unmistakable. Don't believe what you're told, especially when those doing the telling stand to benefit. You can have a little taste of that good life, too. Now, I know you want it. Hell, everybody does. Even if it's a departure, you still know it's a John Carpenter film. Carpenter spent much of the 80s and 90s alternating between studio projects and lower-budget independent films. But his work-for-hire efforts rarely play like homework assignments. They feature the same stylistic craftsmanship and bring in many of the same themes as the movies he worked on from the beginning. His love of Hitchcock's Man on the Run films is evident in the science fiction romance Starman, a gentle, moving effort that suggests he could have had great success indulging his sentimental side. And tell me you love me. I love you. It ends on a dark note. Carpenter doesn't mind leaving viewers unsettled. Dark Star ends with a character surfing to his death in space, an echo of Dr. Strangelove. Michael Myers escapes his apparent death at the end of Halloween. Carpenter even ended the world a few times in what's come to be known as his Apocalypse trilogy. The Thing concludes with its characters destined to die without necessarily having stopped their alien foe from escaping. What do we do? Why don't we just... Wait here for a little while. At the heart of Carpenter's films, there's a distrust of rules and received wisdom, and a confidence that even the most orderly place, be it a scientific lab or a quiet suburb, can descend into chaos. Like Hawks and Ford, Carpenter likes to present himself as a craftsman. Can I ask you what, what particular element about the Western appealed to you from the beginning? I would know. In interviews, he's reluctant to unpack his film's themes. What I hate worse than anything else is pretension in any form. Somebody who's pretentious and is delivering a message. Because I don't think film motion pictures is at all intellectual. I think it's all feelings. And on audio commentaries, he's much more open about the how of his movies than the why of them. We use carbapole, which is the ingredient right. in Twinkies that holds it together. That was our slime. Interpreting, he seems to suggest, is our job. And if we just want to be scared or entertained, that's fine too. Yet, one surefire way to know you're watching a John Carpenter film is the nagging sense that there's much below the surface to unpack. The scary ones are scary, the thrilling ones are thrilling, but they're never just scary, thrilling movies. Whether Carpenter's unsettling a placid small town or destroying the entire world, there's a purposefulness to his films that's hard to mistake. A sense that fearfulness can lead to watchfulness, and those paying attention and not taking anything for granted those who don't accept anything they see at face value are the most likely to make it through the night. You know, it's Halloween. I guess everyone's entitled to one good scare, huh? Hi guys, Susanna and Deborah here. If you like what we do and you want to help us grow, one of the best things you can do is support us on Patreon. We make special polls for our patrons where you can vote for a video you want us to make. And right now we're giving away three free months of MUBI, a really fantastic movie streaming service. Love MUBI. We're such fans. Awesome. And we're giving that away to a limited number of patrons, so be one of the first to go check it out. The link is right here. 